So next up, we have a familiar face to many of you, but for those who don't know, this is Dr. Holly Peterson. So Dr. Peterson is the director of the medical breast program here at Cleveland Clinic and associate professor at the um, Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine. She completed a genetics fellowship at Cleveland Clinic in 2008 and the City of Hope course in 2017. She's actively involved in clinical research across multiple domains and is a co-appointed in the Lerner Research Institute. Today she's talking about a very relevant topic. I think patients come with a lot of questions about lobular cancer genetics and their contralateral breast risk. Thank you. Stay here for a minute. Sure. I just wanted to, you know, recognize uh, Dr. Cruz for the interest that she's taken in lobular breast cancer and the program that she's created here and wanted to thank her. For thank you. Thank you to the organizers, and thank you to our guests from afar. It's really added a lot to the program. Um, I'm going to be talking about lobular breast cancer genetics and contralateral risk, as I often am counseling patients about bilateral mastectomy in the setting of, uh, of a genetic finding. I think that's how I... I came upon this topic. So our, our objectives for today are to explore both the genetic landscape of invasive lobular breast cancer and the implications for surgical management. Um, I am also uh, highly interested in, in the, uh, the, gen the genomics of LCIS, and we'll be talking about that at the, at the panel. Review features and management of CDH1-related diffuse gastric and lobular breast cancer syndrome. That is the new name. They like to rename things all the time. Rather than hereditary diffuse gastric cancer syndrome, it's now CDH1-related diffuse gastric and lobular breast cancer syndrome. We'll compare population-based and observed penetrance estimates and understand why they're different. Why are all these numbers always changing in terms of the estimated lifetime risks for breast cancer or diffuse gastric cancer with these diseases? We'll identify features of the disease that may lead to a more extensive surgical approach and be aware of the overuse of contralateral prophylactic mastectomy, which is only worsening as time goes on, and appreciate the need for vigilant surveillance in the setting of a CDH1 mutation or a history of invasive lobular breast cancer in a patient with remaining breast tissue. So invasive lobular uh, breast cancer uh, is thought to be primarily mediated by the loss of E. cadherin, as has been discussed, coded by the CDH1 gene located on chromosome 16, which acts, like many of these genes, as a tumor suppressor gene. Uh, the lifetime risk of breast cancer for women with the CDH1 mutation is estimated to be between 39 and 52 percent, and it's recommended that women begin mammograms at age 30 with consideration of breast MRI given the risk of lobular histology. Um, you know, the, pe the peculiar growth pattern of invasive lobular makes it difficult to detect by mammography, as we've discussed, and 30% of these lesions are, uh, uh, of invasive lobular breast cancers are mammographically occult. You may be aware of two large uh, uh, case control studies comparing patients with genetic mutations to their counterparts in the population. You know, back at the beginning of, of hereditary risk identification and management, you would hear numbers like a life, an estimated lifetime risk, say with BRCA, up to 87%. And then with uh, prospective studies of, of more typical families, uh, we were seeing numbers such as 70%. These two uh, large case control studies were published in the New England Journal of Medicine in January of uh, 2021, looking at basically the same question from across the pond, uh, the BCAC, Breast Cancer Association Consortium, or the Bridges uh, group out of, out of Europe, 
was really looking at the same question as Dr. Couch's uh, carrier's study at the bottom and really looking at more realistic estimates of these genes. And I just bring this up not so much because it relates as much to lobular cancer and CDH1, but if you look at CDH1, you know, I just mentioned that the risk of breast cancer over the course of one's lifetime was 39 to 52%. If you look at the population comparisons, CDH1 really, uh, you know, had a much lower estimated risk. If you see the odds ratio uh, in each study was much lower. And even if you combine the data in all the syndromic genes, uh, only, only P53 and P10 really turn out to be significant. So you'll see different risk estimates with these different genes depending on the setting and depending on the way that the studies were performed. Mutations in CDH1 are associated with both lobular breast cancer and diffuse gastric cancer, which is a much more rare type of gastric cancer, accounting for about 2% of uh, cases. And truncating pathogenic or likely pathogenic variants in CDH1, which we'll define, are associated with a lifetime risk of gastric cancer of 42% for men and 33% for women. And so the NCCN guidelines have recommended that a complete gastrectomy is recommended between the ages of 18 and 40. And so there are, there are three genes for which we will uh, test minors. Uh, one is P53, because we do see a lot of childhood cancers with leaf romini syndrome. One is P10, which is uh, studied at great length at this institution by Dr. Karis Eng. And, and P10 will result in, in childhood autism and also childhood thyroid cancers as early as the age of seven. So with uh, CDH1 mutations, we tend to recommend testing for these families in their late teens. You know, autosomal dominant mode of inheritance, 50-50 chance that each child uh, has received the, uh, has inherited the mutation. And Psychologically, these kids really need to prepare, especially for uh, the, the possibility of a total gastrectomy at such an early age. So that's something to keep in mind. It's always a question as to what do you do with a, a family that carries CDH1 and there's no family history of diffuse gastric cancer. Um, and, and that's a tricky one. There are several mutations that we uh, are aware of where it really does seem to predispose just to breast cancer and not to diffuse gastric cancer, but we can't count on that at the present time um, in terms of a lack of family history being okay to not worry as much about diffuse gastric cancer. And in fact, one small study found that more than half of, more than half of individuals with CDH1 mutations who lacked a family history of gastric cancer had early gastric cancer at the time of gastrectomy. And so, you know, something to really keep in mind. So as has been discussed at length, uh, tumors are often larger than expected uh, in terms of the clinical presentation of invasive lobular breast cancer. And occult lymph node involvement is very common. Uh, we do very commonly use MRI here preoperatively in predicting uh, size and nodal involvement. Multicentricity and bilaterality are particular concerns and of course do affect the surgical approach. And as was mentioned uh, before, there's a, a very unique presentation of metastatic spread to the GI tract, pleura, peritoneum, ocular, and leptomeninges. And so it's, 
it's important to keep in mind as we're following these patients that they may present with a, an odd constellation of symptoms in the metastatic setting. One thing that's not commonly known is that combined hormonal therapy in the postmenopausal setting, uh, estrogen and progesterone specifically, increases the risk of lobular breast cancer primarily, and not so much uh, invasive ductal cancer. Um, we know from the Women's Health Initiative study that the combined use of estrogen and a synthetic progestin uh, was found to increase breast cancer risk by 26%. Thus, the Women's Health Initiative study was abruptly stopped in March of 2002, uh, and the media made a a, a, a big deal out of this 26% increase, which is certainly significant. But if you look at the average risk of an average woman, the average risk over the next five years of a 60-year-old woman is 1.66%. The average risk of a 50-year-old woman is 1.53%. So in absolute terms, a 26% increase over 1.53 or 1.66 is really not, uh, is really a level of risk that many women are willing to, uh, to undertake in order to get through menopause. So that's something that I wanted people to take away as well, that, there, that that has really been blown out of proportion, but, the, uh, the risk is really with lobular breast cancer. This large case control study that was done by Lee um, examined women who were age 55 to 74 and found that current estrogen and combined hormonal therapy use were associated with a 1.6-fold increased risk for estrogen alone and a 2.3-fold increased risk of lobular breast cancer alone uh, uh, in that setting. For combined use, it's felt to be safe completely for three years and probably five years. And from the Women's Health Initiative study, it was found in the estrogen-only arm, and I, I shouldn't say estrogen-only arm, but conjugated equine estrogen-only arm, that there was actually a reduction in breast cancer risk over time with estrogen alone, uh, despite the combined hormone therapy causing a 26% increased risk. But in terms of lobular breast cancer risk seen in this study by Lee, you only saw an increased risk with estrogen alone after nine years of use. And, and not many women continue hormonal therapy after nine years. So special imaging considerations, which has also been discussed. The sensitivity of mammography in detecting invasive lobular cancer is about 57 to 81%. Across the board, the sensitivity of screening mammography may be as high as 85%, limited by breast density uh, in our younger women, specifically studied with BRCA mutations, in their 30s, the sensitivity of screening mammography may be as low as 30 to 50%. And again, 30% of invasive lobular cancers are mammographically occult. And they don't show up as a circumscribed mass or calcifications. These are actually unusual findings for the most part with invasive lobular cancer. The, um, the radiologic spectrum is very different. Uh, the sensitivity for MRI is much higher at 93 to 96%. So I wanted to go over a little bit about these genetic definitions because it's incredibly important. And uh, as we go forward, more and more disease states will be linked to genetics. Breast cancer just happens to be at the forefront. And when one undergoes genetic testing, 
Both a pathogenic variant and a likely pathogenic variant are considered to be positive results. And so there are basically five categories of results for genetic testing. You'll have pathogenic, likely pathogenic, a variant of uncertain significance, a probably benign variant, and a benign polymorphism. And what's uh, been seen, interestingly, with, uh, with, inv with CDH1 mutations is that the variants of uncertain significance uh, really don't uh, seem to increase the risk of, of disease. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So variants of uncertain significance are exactly that. They are changes in the DNA about which we are learning more and we don't know at the present time whether they cause cancer or not. They're clinically treated as negative and we, we don't, uh, we don't take them into account in terms of surgical planning or, uh, or even uh, uh, watching patients in terms of uh, breast or gastric cancer. Truncating variants are variants that the DNA is stopped in transcription, and so the, the protein that serves as the tumor suppressor is not made. Uh, and so truncating variants generally result in, in a pathogenic or likely pathogenic variant, whereas missense variants are when the nucleotide that is replaced may not affect the protein that is produced or may produce a protein of similar function. And so that's just a little bit more about genetics uh, in terms of when you're getting these reports back and, and interpreting them. The reason that, that uh, CDH1-related diffuse gastric and lobular breast cancer syndrome is syndromic is that there are physical findings that can be associated, not frequently with the disease, but uh, CDH1 can be associated with cleft lip and cleft palate. As has been discussed, but has not been as clearly defined, there are two different types of mutations, germline mutations like in CDH1 and somatic mutations which are those that are found in the tumors themselves. And um, we heard this morning about the somatic mutations that are involved in invasive lobular breast cancer quite elegantly. Um, and what I'm really referring to are the germline CDH1 mutations. So germline mutations are those that can be passed from one generation to the next. Uh, they're present in half of the uh, gametes when, when people reproduce, whereas somatic mutations cannot be passed on. They are present only in the tumor. So truncating pathogenic or likely pathogenic variants are associated with the syndrome, whereas these rare missense VUS are not associated with the syndrome. And so I think that that's, that's kind of interesting. They're, uh, in, in the case of BRCA, variants of uncertain significance are reclassified to benign um, over 90% of the time, probably 95% of the time. And in this particular syndrome, the VUS are not associated at all with the syndrome, the missense variants. So when you have a patient with invasive lobular breast cancer, you'll find a CDH1 mutation about 3% of the time. With diffuse gastric cancer, it's about 2% of the time that you'll find a mutation. And amongst these lobular breast cancer patients, the ones that have CDH1 mutations, only about 3% of those are the ones that I referred to 
that only increase the risk of breast cancer and not gastric cancer. And we're seeing that with BRCA, particularly with BRCA2, there are some variants that only increase the risk of breast and not ovarian cancer. So more to watch. I mean, we're, we're gonna be learning more, not only about penetrance estimates with these syndromes in general, but penetrance estimates given each individual uh, mutation that's seen. So I think that that's, that's really interesting and, and up and coming. So surgical management. I am not a surgeon. <laughs> I'm an internist by training, and I've been running the high-risk clinic since 1997, so I'm one of, one of the older people in this room. Um, and we certainly have a lot of surgeons to ask uh, these questions of. But uh, as uh, Dr. Tendulkar pointed out, uh, breast conservation is certainly an option for women with early stage disease. The multifocality and multicentricity of invasive lobular cancer may lead us in a different direction in terms of treatment of the affected side. But um, I wanted to talk about contralateral disease as well. It, it's known with BRCA1 and BRCA2 that uh, doing contralateral prophylactic mastectomy does reduce mortality. And with, um, with CDH1 as well, there is a, a known increased risk, increase in contralateral risk of up to 29%, um, which can influence surgical decision making. Um, but it's not known really, other than the predisposition that's there, if doing a contralateral prophylactic mastectomy uh, reduces mortality in this setting. Uh, because the hormonal medication that's almost universally given, because these are almost always hormone sensitive, um, in combination with the heightened surveillance, leads to early detection and risk reduction in this setting. 30% are multifocal, and 6 to 10% at presentation are contralateral, which clearly may influence the surgical approach. And uh, as I mentioned, that breast conservation is an appropriate treatment strategy should the patient wish to proceed in that direction and is a good candidate for it. Um, and so, you know, just this is just another another way, another study that that showed essentially the same thing that we do see multifocal disease and and contralateral disease. But the contralateral disease um, is largely seen at at presentation, and uh, not so much will you see uh, mammographically occult cancers that are not caught by the MRI when you're following these patients. Uh, not only is the size of the tumor not underestimated, but we, we also find that the nodal status is underestimated, even with MRI in invasive lobular cancer. So this study um, done here at the clinic, um, I believe Dr. Valente was on it as well. Um, yeah, she, she was, I think that she was at the senior author, I believe. But in terms of uh, contralateral breast cancer rates, what was seen here at our institution was a rate of 6%, uh, but with subsequent contralateral breast cancer rates among patients not treated with contralateral mastectomy, there were only 2.3% uh, of patients over a six-year follow-up period that were shown to have contralateral disease, equating to a risk of about 0.3% per year. In gene-negative patients, we have really been quoting 0.3 to 0.7% max, but closer to 0.3% in patients uh, in terms of risk of developing a new primary cancer if they do not carry a gene. And here with uh, 
patients with CDH1, we're seeing a 0.3% per year risk, which can be very reassuring to patients in the surveillance setting. And this is work by Allison Curran out of Stanford, looking at how common these bilateral mastectomies are. Uh, you can see from, if I can figure out how to do it, but I probably can't. So if you can see the patients that test negative on multi-gene panel testing, 24% of patients who do not carry genetic mutations are currently choosing bilateral mastectomy, despite this 0.3% per year risk of the development of a new primary. Uh, in patients with VUS only, fortunately, we have great genetic counselors that advise patients that having a VUS is not clinically actionable and the rate of bilateral mastectomy is similar to those that don't carry a mutation at 24%, which is kind of embarrassingly high. But um, with a pathogenic variant, BRCA1 or BRCA2, we see a bilateral mastectomy rate across the, uh, in, in her series of 66.1%, which is rather low, I think. But what we do see is that anyone who has another gene, and you know they may have a highly penetrant gene, in which case risk-reducing surgery on the other side is appropriate, but many patients have moderate risk genes uh, where the risk of developing a new primary may not be as high, and a bilateral mastectomy rate of 43% is still very high. Now, CDH1 being with a risk of 39 to 52% just kind of crosses that threshold where we think about risk-reducing mastectomy bilaterally in patients who are identified or in contralateral uh, prophylactic mastectomy in affected patients. Generally, if your risk is greater than 50% of developing a new primary, then risk-reducing mastectomy is not unreasonable. And that is the case with all the highly penetrant genes, BRCA1, BRCA2, PALB2, P53, P10, CDH1 and STK11, which we don't see a lot of uh, because it's so rare, fortunately. This was a series uh, by NARAD in Canada uh, looking at the risk of contralateral breast cancer, uh, a, SEER, a SEER database analysis, and it showed across the board a, a contralateral rate of 0.4% per year over a 25-year period. So clearly, you know, we're, we're over-utilizing uh, bilateral mastectomy and uh, contralateral prophylactic mastectomy, but as you can see from the beautiful results, <laughs> you know, um, the uh, patients are choosing it not only on the basis of risk, but on the basis of cosmesis. And, you know, I, I, I talked to Dr. Bernard about the possibility of, of, of considering bilateral radiation in, in patients and even in considering it preventively. I thought that was, that was kind of interesting how well those, those cases are, are coming out and the patients preferring their radiated side. Um, so this was another study looking at a two-year follow-up, a very short follow-up. Uh, but again, patients with a negative MRI at diagnosis did not develop contralateral disease uh, in the first two years. And the uh, negative predictive value of MRI in this setting was 99%, which is very reassuring to patients as well. In other words, if the MRI is negative, disease is not likely to be present. So how do we follow patients with CDH1? These are current NCCN guidelines. Um, 
the absolute risk in these guidelines is divided into standardized chunks. And so this 41 to 60% is just high risk, whereas the actual numbers are more like 39 to 52%. We recommend both mammographic and MRI screening beginning at the age of 30. And because patients do have a greater than 50% estimated lifetime risk for the development of the disease, we do discuss risk-reducing surgery, uh, bilateral mastectomy, either with or without reconstruction uh, per patient uh, choice. Um, there is no established association with ovarian cancer, and we've spoken about the hereditary diffuse gastric cancer risk of up to 33% in women, um, but we still are really not sure what to do with those patients who have no family history of, of gastric cancer, but do have the CDH1 mutation. We refer them both here to our uh, surgical colleagues to discuss risk-reducing gastrectomy, as well as our GI colleagues for uh, endoscopic surveillance. It's important if you are referring people to GI for surveillance that that person knows that they need to take like multiple biopsies, at, you know, probably close to 20 biopsies with each endoscopy to look for findings of early gastric cancer. Uh, we talked about the uh, MRI going on till age 70 per our CCF care path, but we also uh, recognize the American College of Radiology's recommendations for MRI in survivors who are under the age of 50 at diagnosis with remaining dense breast, with remaining breast tissue, or anyone with remaining dense breast tissue. Um, at, at Cleveland Clinic, we extend the follow-up with MRI to survivors. So in conclusion, invasive lobular breast cancer, particularly in the setting of a personal or family history of diffuse gastric cancer, may signify a germline CDH1 mutation about 3% of the time. 30% of ILC are mammographically occult, and MRI is more sensitive at detecting the disease. And considerations for surgical management include the presence of a CDH1 mutation, multifocality and multicentricity, contralateral disease, a prior history of breast cancer, the patient's age, and the presence of ER negative disease, which may increase the risk of contralateral breast cancer, but is uncommon in this setting. Uh, if CDH1 positive, consideration should be given to complete gastrectomy between the ages of 18 and 40. And patients who choose to retain their breast tissue should be offered ongoing MRI screening at least until age 70 uh, if they are healthy per CCF care path. And we talked about the ACR guidelines for survivors as well. So thank you again for having me. Uh, thank you for all you do in this field. And, and it's really exciting to see some of the new work. Have a good uh, lunch after our panel. Thanks.